Platonic solids are prominent in the philosophy of Plato, their namesake. He associated each of the four classical elements, earth, air, water, and fire, with a regular solid. Earth was associated with the cube, air with the octahedron, water with the icosahedron, and fire, the tetrahedron. Theotetus gave a mathematical description of all five and may have been responsible for the first known proof that no other convex regular polyhedra exist. Platonic solids are of interest to researchers because they show up frequently in nature. For example, in biology, many viruses take the form of an icosahedron. Kepler also was fascinated with platonic solids. A polyhedron is a 3D object whose faces are polygons, and these faces intersect at what we call edges. When three or more edges intersect at these corners, they form vertices. A convex set is a set of points where if you draw between any two points in that set, that entire line segment will still be within that set. So non-convex set or a concave set is a set where this does not always happen. Take Pac-Man, for example. If you choose these two points and draw a line, that line is outside the Pac-Man region. And this idea of a convex set extends to three-dimensional objects, such as polyhedrons. Regular polyhedrons are made by piecing together congruent copies of the same regular polygon. So if you have a bunch of squares all of the same size, you can put them together to form a cube. Platonic solids are a special class of polyhedra that satisfy all our previous definitions. What makes a platonic solid unique is that its faces, edges, and corresponding angles are all congruent. So basically, it's a very nice, structured polyhedron. There are five known platonic solids, namely the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. We will show later that these five are the only platonic solids. The Schlafly symbol is a special way of classifying regular polyhedra. It consists of two numbers, P and Q. P tells us the number of sides on each polygon face. For example, if P equals 3, we know that the faces are equilateral triangles. If P equals 4, the faces of the polyhedron are squares. If P equals 5, the faces are regular pentagons. Now, Q tells us the number of edges attached to each vertex. Notice that this is actually the same as the number of faces attached to each vertex. So we'll keep that in mind as we move on. It's important to remember how we define P and Q as we will later use this in proving our theorem. So moving on to the main theorem, which states that there are exactly five platonic solids, as we've mentioned before. Now, remember that regular polyhedra can be identified by their Schlafly symbol. To show that there are at most five platonic solids, we will find bounds for the values of the Schlafly symbols. In other words, we'll find a range for the possible values of P and Q. For the first lemma, we want to show that a vertex is a meeting of at least three faces. So a vertex is defined as the meeting of three or more edges. So beginning with one face, we can see that there are no edges. If we add another face, we'll see that they intersect at most in one edge. However, we still have no vertex. So finally, if we add a third face, we can finally get three edges, which will give us a vertex. Therefore, at least three faces meet at each vertex. Now recall that Q in our Schlafly symbol is the number of faces attached to each vertex. Hence, 
we now have a lower bound for q, namely 3. Now lemma 2 is a basic fact in elementary geometry. To prove this, we'll start by finding the sum of interior angles in a regular polygon. So first off, recall that in a triangle, the sum of its angles is 180 degrees. If you take a quadrilateral, this can be cut into two triangles. Hence, the sum of its interior angles is 360 degrees. It will show inductively that the interior angle sum of a regular polygon is n minus 2 times 180 degrees. So, given an n-sided polygon, notice that we can cut it into a triangle and an n minus 1-sided polygon. And so by induction, the interior angle sum of the n minus 1-sided polygon is n minus 3 times 180. And we know already that the interior angle sum of the triangle is 180. So adding these up gives us n minus 2 times 180. Therefore, by induction, the interior angle sum of an n-sided polygon is n minus 2 times 180 degrees. Now because regular polygons all have equal interior angle measures, to get that, we just need to divide their sum by the number of sides. Thus, each interior angle is n minus 2 times 180 divided by n degrees. This will be useful later on when finding an upper bound for q. So putting them together, from our first lemma, we have that each vertex has to be contained in at least three faces. And this gives us a lower bound for q, which is the number of faces attached to each vertex. From our second lemma, we can find the interior angle measures of each polygon face. This is important because around each vertex, when you add up the interior angle measures, that sum should not exceed 360, nor reach 360. This is because if it's 360, that vertex will lie on a flat plane. And if it exceeds that, our polyhedron will no longer be convex. The interior angle measures of a regular triangle, square, and pentagon are 60, 90, and 108 respectively. So when p equals 3, that is, it has triangular faces, it can have at most 5 faces around a vertex. This is because we don't want the sum to exceed 360. When p equals 4, or when the faces are squares, we can have at most 3 faces around each vertex, because 4 faces will give us a sum of 360. When p equals 5, the interior angles are 108, and so there can be at most 3 faces around a vertex. Now notice that for any regular polygon with 6 sides or more, its interior angles will be 120 degrees or greater. Hence, at most two of them can meet at a vertex to avoid concaveness or flatness. But this is impossible because from our first lemma, we know that there should be at least three faces around a vertex. So this eliminates values for p greater than 5. And so now for when p equals 3, there are only three possible values for q, namely q, q equals 3, q equals 4, or q equals 5. So when p equals 4, we know that the only possible value for q is 3. When p equals 5, the only possible value for q is also 3. Thus, the Schlafly symbol of a platonic solid must be one of these five. Therefore, there are, there are at most five different platonic solids. And since we know of five different platonic solids, there must be exactly these five platonic solids. The Schlafly symbols imply something very interesting about the platonic solids. Here we look at their duals. The duals is basically when we swap the faces for vertices and the vertices for faces. There are many ways to construct the dual of a platonic solid. So take for example the cube, 
When we get centers of each face and connect these points, we will find the octahedron. And in fact, if we do the same process to the octahedron within, we will get a cube in return. And this interesting fact shows that the dual of a dual is the original object itself. Now this is where the Schlafly symbol comes in. If the Schlafly symbol of some polyhedron is PQ, taking its dual will make the vertices faces and the faces vertices. So if P was the number of edges around the face, in the original polyhedron, that will now be the number of faces around the vertex in the dual. And in the same way, Q, which is originally the number of faces or edges around a vertex, that will now be the number of edges around a face, which is the same thing as the number of sides of each face. Therefore, if the Schlafly symbol of the original polyhedron was PQ, the Schlafly symbol of its dual will be QP. So from this, we'll, we could see that the tetrahedron is self-dual, the cube and octahedrons are duals of each other, and the dodecahedron and icosahedron are duals of each other.